There are a lot of radiation measurement instruments, but how do you know which ones to use? Well, it all depends on the situation. In the following video, Radiation Survey Instruments, produced by the Department of Energy and TEP, you will see the following scenarios. First response, second response, and cleanup and post-cleanup survey. There is some good information in the video. The mention of neutrons may be a bit confusing. You will see neutron sources with other meters, but the dose rate reading will not be correct. Even so, you will still have a yes-no indication. This video uses old units. It mentions 1 millirem per hour, which is the same as 0.01 millisieverts or 10 microsieverts per hour. It also mentions 1000 millirem per hour, which is the same as 10 millisieverts or 10,000 microsieverts per hour. As a first responder, you are probably accustomed to using detection equipment to help better quantify hazardous materials at an incident scene. If you suspect radioactive materials may be involved at an incident, radiological survey instruments can help you quantify the radiological hazard. As with other types of monitoring equipment, it is important that you are properly trained on how to use your radiological survey instrumentation. There are two broad categories of radiological survey instruments, those designed to measure radiation exposure and those that are designed to detect radioactive contamination. Many survey instruments use detector probes attached by cable to a main instrument. These instruments have the ability to measure either radiation exposure or detect contamination, depending on which type of probe is attached to the survey instrument. With these types of instruments, the probe can be changed depending on the situation and what you are trying to detect. Most survey instruments have speakers which provide the technician with audio indications of the presence of radiation or contamination. It is normal to hear some clicking even in a clean area. This is due to natural background radiation. When the instruments find radioactive material, the clicking can and will speed up do not become alarmed at rapid clicking. Many of these instruments are sensitive and the actual amount of material may be very small, thus posing no significant danger to anyone. At an incident scene, it is important that you select the correct type of instrument to assess radiation exposure levels present and to check for radioactive contamination. Let's first look at instruments used to measure radiation exposure. Radioactive material can emit alpha, beta, gamma, or neutron radiation, or even a combination of these. Gamma and neutron radiation have the ability to penetrate the body, potentially causing harm. Exposure rate survey instruments typically read out in units of microrentgen or millirentgen per hour and are designed to measure the intensity of the penetrating gamma radiation field. Remember, you may be exposed to radiation at an incident scene even when packages are intact. The radiation exposure levels you may encounter can be quite high. Exclusive use vehicles may be transporting packages reading up to 1,000 millirems per hour on contact. Use the concepts of time, distance, and shielding to accomplish the emergency response goals while minimizing your radiation exposure. An exposure rate survey instrument enables you to assess whether the radiation levels you detect are consistent with the vehicle placarding and the warning labels or markings found on the packaging. Remember, radioactive warning labels are designed to inform you of the potential radiation levels present. And for yellow 2 and yellow 3 labels, the transport index number tells you the expected radiation level one meter from the package. When your exposure survey measurements don't match the package labeling, this could be an indication that the package has been breached or the source may be missing. If an incident involves material that would emit neutrons, very specialized instruments are required. 
If you're interested in further information on instrument design or selection criteria, contact your state or local radiation authority for more information. In areas where the radiation levels are elevated, or if you suspect breached packages, swipes or smears may be taken, removed to an area where the surrounding radiation levels are near normal background, and measured to detect any removable contamination that may be present. Let's take a look at contamination survey instruments and methods for taking contamination surveys. Contamination survey instruments usually read out in counts per minute, or CPM, and are used to detect the presence of radioactive material. Remember, contamination is radioactive material in an unwanted location. Radiation is the energy. Contamination is the material. Most contamination instruments will usually have some type of open window, like the one shown here, that will allow alpha and beta radiation to be detected in addition to penetrating gamma radiation. This type of probe is often referred to as a Frisker or Pancake GM probe. There are a variety of contamination probes available and not all probes are alike. Some detectors are designed specifically to detect only certain types of radiation. For example, the detector shown here is designed specifically to detect alpha radiation, but it cannot detect beta or gamma radiation. You should consider monitoring for contamination if you suspect that radioactive material has been released in an accident. An example would be a breached shipping package. Shipping packages, whether breached or intact, will most likely be giving off penetrating gamma radiation. This is due to the radioactive material inside the package and may not be a result of contamination. Because of this, direct contamination monitoring of a package is difficult, if not impossible. Contamination monitoring is usually accomplished using the swipe method. Pre-made swipes, like the ones shown here, are commonly available. But a variety of other materials, such as paper towels or 4x4s, could be used as a wipe material. Protective clothing should always be worn when taking smear samples to minimize the chance of personnel contamination. When conducting a wipe test, use moderate pressure and wipe an area of about 100 square centimeters, which is approximately the size of your palm. Once smears have been taken, they should be kept separate to avoid cross-contamination. Smear packets, similar to the ones shown here, make this easy and are available from a variety of vendors. If pieces of cloth or paper towel are used, they can be kept separate by using plastic storage bags. Data should be maintained indicating the date and location of each smear sample. Smears can be counted in the field using a contamination survey meter. The smears should be counted in a low background area by properly trained personnel. You should become familiar with your jurisdiction or state's guidelines for when an object is considered contaminated. For example, some jurisdictions use twice background or 100 CPM above background as a positive indication of contamination. Another important use of contamination survey instruments is checking responders and equipment for radioactive contamination upon exiting the control zone. However, it would be hard to determine if someone is contaminated if the area in which they were standing was in a radiation field. For example, assume the contamination shown here on this napkin is on your skin or clothing. In a low background area, the contamination is easy to detect. However, if you were to stand next to a radiation source or in a field of radiation, it becomes much more difficult to distinguish the contamination from the high background rate caused by the radiation source. In order to properly check personnel and equipment, contamination surveys should be done in areas away from the hot zone, where readings are at or near background levels. The importance of knowing how to properly use your radiation detection equipment cannot be overstated. Proper understanding of your radiological survey instruments and how they function will assist in providing you with more information on the hazards present at the scene.
So if we look at the CNSC guidance for an emergency situation, CNSC says that up to 1,000 millisieverts per hour is okay as long as you limit your time. So you should have a meter that can measure that high. Not a lot of gamma meters out there can. Most of them are exposed for use in occupational situations where the worker is continually exposed at low radiation dose rates. They are not designed for emergency situations where you can limit the time in a high radiation area. Interestingly enough, the two gamma meters shown in the CNSC poster get nowhere near 1000 millisieverts an hour. One goes to 10 millisieverts an hour and the other to 2 millisieverts an hour. Those are not very high dose rates for acute exposure scenarios. Certainly orders of magnitude below the dose rate from an x-ray or a CT scan. Gamma radiation is the easiest to measure. Meters are rugged and most radioactive material has some gamma or neutron field associated with it. Gamma is the main hazard as long as you don't ingest any radioactive material. Probably most importantly, the instrument has to be cheap enough and ergonomic enough so that you actually have it when you need it. You want to be able to use the meter and make sense of the results years after you've taken this course. You don't want your meter to overrange at trivial doses. And you want to know the limitation of your instrument. If you know that your instrument is only accurate to within an order of magnitude, at least it will tell you if radiation exposure will be a concern or not. Then you can still decide if you need to wait for more sophisticated instrumentation to get there. If you know your meter is good to about 50% and it's only a minor emergency, then maybe you may decide to stop at 125 millisieverts rather than 250. My point is that you need to know your instrument's limitations so that you can make informed decisions. A gamma meter that reads up to 1000 millisieverts an hour will probably not be sensitive enough to do your hot zone, cold zone delineation. You would use a typical gamma meter that's included in occupational settings for this purpose. There's no shortage of those on the market. And we make these too, and they're included in your kit. Ours are smaller, lighter, and more ergonomic and easier to use than the others, but the others will also do the job. If no one will be working in any really hot areas, the general purpose gamma meter will do. Otherwise, you need something designed for higher dose rates, like our Gamma Guard app. A 15 centimeter squared pancake is the standard way to measure contamination. Pretty much every instrument manufacturer has their own version of this. We have one too, which we think is smaller, more ergonomic, and easier to use. There are two types of personal decimeters. There are the type that you send in to get read out, and then there are the direct reading ones. The send in ones are cheap and accurate, but you don't get the results until a month after you finish the job. So they are useless at dose control. Our Gamma Guard app can be used as a direct reading decimeter, and so can all of our other gamma meters. Again, it's very important that the decimeter can respond to the dose rates present. At this stage, there will be someone from the CNSC or another authority guiding the process. In a pinch, you can use the general purpose gamma meter to check the area after it's been cleaned up. The problem is that at background dose rates, the reading jumps around too much to get an accurate reading, or you would have to set the averaging time so high that it would take forever to take a single reading. For example, our general purpose gamma meters read out a 6 second average or a 2 minute average. 
At background levels, you would need to look at the two-minute value. A better way to do background surveys is to use a sodium iodide scintillator. These are much more sensitive and you will easily see the differences that you would never find with a general survey meter. These instruments would be useless in a first response situation as the sodium iodide scintillator would saturate at trivial dose rates. For this project we have eight of these sodium iodide scintillators so not every kit has one.